Well, good afternoon and welcome. I'm opening this joint meeting of the Hood River County, Multnomah County, and Clackamas County Boards of Commissioners. This is the time and place designated by the Secretary of State for filling the vacancy in Oregon House District 52. I am Clackamas County Commissioner Paul Savas, and I have been designated by the Secretary of State to chair this meeting. I'd like to start us out by calling for the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join me. Okay, uh, we are waiting for a couple of commissioners to arrive, so I'm just going to proceed. So if I uh, misstate the number of commissioners present, uh, we'll have that clarified here momentarily. So we have uh, five of the five commissioners present from Clackamas County, uh, and five of the commissioners present from Hood River County, and three of the five commissioners present from Onoma County. Several of the commissioners are joining us by phone, and I will now check on those. Join us by phone, so I'll call for your presence. Uh, Clackamas County Commissioner Sonia Fisher. Here. Hood River County Chair Ron Rivers. I'm here, Paul. Hood River County Commissioner Bob Benton. Here. Hood River County Commissioner Karen Joplin. Yes. Hood River County Commissioner Rich McBride. Here. Hood River County Commissioner Les Perkins. Okay. Not here. Uh, Multnomah County Commissioner uh, Jessica Vega Peterson. Here. And Multnomah County Chair Deborah Cafori. Here. Okay. Thank you. Um, absent so far is uh, Commissioner Lori Stegman from Multnomah County. She is on her way up. And Chair Savas. Okay, she's on her way. And um, and Commissioner Sharon Myron. And okay. And correct. So I have I have not taken role yet for for those. Yes. Okay. So I. Um, so I'd like to introduce our staff support for today's meeting. Our clerk today is Kevin Moss, and our legal advisors today are Assistant Camp Clackamas County Council. Um, Chris Story and Multnomah County Attorney Jenny Madcor, who's not here. Okay. It'll be just me. So I'll cross her out. Um, Kevin Moss from Clackamas County will serve as a clerk for this meeting. Kevin will please call the roll for all three boards starting with Hood River County. This will include everyone. Yes. Uh, Chair Rivers. I'm here. Commissioner Benton. Here. Commissioner Joplin. Here. Commissioner McBride. Here. Commissioner Perkins. For Multnomah County, Chair Kafori. Here. Commissioner Myron. Here. Commissioner Smith. Here. Uh, Commissioner Stegman, we've been told is on her way. And uh, Commissioner Vega Peterson. Here. Uh, Clackamas County, Chair Jim Bernard. Here. Commissioner Fisher. Here. Commissioner Humbertson. Here. Commissioner Schrader. Here. Chair Savas. Here. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, before we discuss the procedures here today, uh, I'd like to uh, well, actually have it a backup. Uh, at this point, uh, because of a little bit of confusion um, as to, and, and the, oh, here's Commissioner Stegman. So we'll register here as present. Uh, I just want to make sure that because of the time frame and the abbreviated opportunity to meet everyone and um, any other confusion about how this came to be, I just want to know if there's any objections or concerns anyone wants to express. I'm specifically asking the commissioners at this point in time. Well, I, I wanted to address a concern. Uh, the Oregonian suggested uh, that there was some undue influence by the Speaker of the House and by SEIU. I actually have not received, and no one, there may be somebody who received a call, but I didn't. There has been no undue influence. I did, however, uh, receive a copy of an email that was sent out by Mark Johnson 
using his legislative email address, which he is not in the legislature anymore, therefore shouldn't be using it, that uh, asks uh, Mark Johnson sent out an email on 11-28-2017 at 6-22-04 p.m. And he says that he was still hearing reports of outside de-influence efforts to influence the vote for Stan. I want to say that I've talked to all these people. Uh, they are all well qualified. And uh, there has been no undue influence to uh, on I, any of them. Uh, I've had an opportunity to meet with Stan and, and talk on the phone with the others. And I think they're all very highly qualified and would uh, uh, be an honor to support one of them uh, uh, today. So uh, just want to make sure it's clear that the Oregonian article was not true. They did call me uh, and ask me, and I told them no. And I know that they called other people and asked them, and they told them no. So it seems writing an article about a suspicious influence when no one actually said they had seems a little odd. And Commissioner, I, I didn't see the article. Did, uh, did they say that someone the was not qualified? Pardon? Did they say the candidates weren't qualified? I didn't see the article. Uh, I'm sorry. So, uh, uh, Chair Rivers, Chair, Chair, Chair Rivers, Paul, this is Ron. Yes, Ron. And uh, I had a call yesterday, and I think Karen had one and Bob had one. Then, and uh, they asked me if there had been any any contacts, and I told them absolutely none. And um, and when he wrote the article, I think he was just trying to make an article. <laughs> uh, <laughs> nothing happened here at this, at this end. Okay. So, I, okay. Thank you, Ron. And I want to get back to Chris, Commissioner Smith. So I didn't, mm -hmm. Hear her comments, Commissioner Smith. Sorry. No, I was saying, did someone say that, that the uh, candidates were not qualified? Is that what? No, I didn't see the article. No, not, not none was well, qualified. Exactly. Okay. It was undue influence. Okay. Commissioner okay. Schreier. And just for for to let folks know, I had served with Senator Bruce Starr in the leg legislature on business and transportation, and he texted me today, asking the same thing, and I texted him back because everything on my phone's public record. Um, texted him back and said that no, I hadn't heard from anybody, that's the truth, and um, people would know better than to try and influence me one way or the other. Uh, I based my decision on looking at the resumes and uh, hearing how the candidates uh, answer the question. So I just want to make sure that, I don't know where this came from, but um, I guess it just gets interesting sometimes. Commissioner so. Stegman. Thank you, Commissioner Savas. Uh, I would just reiterate uh, what my fellow commissioners are saying. I have not been contacted by any of those people mentioned in that article. Uh, I have talked to all three candidates, either over the phone or in person, uh, and that uh, contrary to what that article also led you to believe, uh, I am a progressive <coughs> Republican. There are Republicans that are here, uh, so just want to make that clear. Uh, and that uh, I, I and I believe all my other fellow commissioners are going to allow the process uh, to determine the best outcome. And I certainly haven't come here with my mind made up. Uh, I'm here to to follow the process and select the most qualified, experienced person for the job. Okay, great, thank you. I would just add uh, to what my fellow commissioners have said as well. I was not contacted by anyone um, attempting any influence on the process. I was not contacted by any reporters regarding this process. I also have spoken to all of the candidates, either on the phone or in person, um, am very impressed by all of them and also come here with an open mind and um, look forward to the process uh, tonight. Thank you. Up, uh, pardon? One more. Ms. What they said. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chair, I, I just want to add to this. Uh, I've talked to all three of the candidates uh, by phone as well. So uh, I have an open mind about this process and, and I don't have a predetermined. I do as well. So I thank everyone yes. for their comments. There was also a little bit of. Um, questions or confusion about how the chair was selected and I, I believe over a statute uh, 171.060 sub 2 states that really the, the Secretary of State has the option of selecting the chairperson of this meeting. 
Uh, apparently, uh, in my packet here today, I actually have the policy from the Secretary of State's office, which I'll read aloud, um, which identifies how he really implemented that option. Um, so it reads as such, uh, when naming a chair for the purpose, for this purpose, the secretary will, number one, select a commissioner of the same political party as the party of nominees. If there are no commissioners who are registered as members of that party, the secretary of state will, number two, select a commissioner that is registered to vote as not affiliated with the party. If there are no commissioners that meet criteria one or two, the Secretary of State will select, number three, the chair of the Board of Commissioners of the county that has the most registered voters in the district of the vacancy. Commissioner Savas has been selected to chair the joint meeting. So here we are today, and I will get back to my script and procedure here. Barring any other comments? I see none. So, uh, Kevin, uh, before we discuss the, or excuse me, before we discuss the procedure here today, I'd like to welcome the three nominees chosen by the Republican precinct committee persons of House District 52 to replace former Representative Mark Johnson. They are Mr. Eric Haney, Mr. Jeff Helfrich, and Mr. Stan Pulliam. Uh, it has been decided that these, nominee, these three nominees will speak in alphabetical order, and I will now outline the procedures for today's meeting that were highlighted on the approved agenda provided the commissioners from all three counties prior to this meeting. So there's been, at this point, I want to because there are 15 commissioners involved here, or almost 15, and it's, it's going to be a long meeting perhaps, it's been suggested that we uh, abbreviate this to five questions perhaps. And I just want to um, query the commissioners um, if they are interested in each asking a question or um, narrowing this down to five questions. Um, so I'll just, Chair Bernard. Well, uh, we talked about perhaps the chair asking the five questions and that they just answer, uh, you know, what the five, wait, actually they're listening. They just answer the five <laughs> questions. Otherwise we may be on hold waiting for somebody to ask a question. So it just seems that would be faster, cleaner, and more efficient. Uh, Commissioner Meyer. Did, I thought, um, in turn, and I'm not sure if this is the part that we're discussing, but in terms of asking asking questions from the commissioners, um, I thought two questions from each of the commissions, so it would be six questions, okay. I guess. And I know that um, uh, my fellow commissioners and I um, do have spoken amongst ourselves to come up with um, consensus questions that uh, we feel are, are good to pose to the candidates. Okay. So Willamette so County has narrowed to two questions? We've narrowed to two questions. Um, and so I will ask our Hood River um, colleagues sure. to, um, uh, Chair Rivers, do you have any, or anyone from Hood River wants to uh, chime no, in? No, I, I, think, I think that uh, um, my commissioners can come up with two questions. Uh, I'd ask Karen, she probably has one. And I think probably Bob or uh, Rich has one. Um, you guys decide amongst yourselves. And if we can expedite this um, proceedings, it'd be great. Okay, so what, what I'll do while, uh, um, okay, uh, while you're this doing is, that. Uh, Paul, this is Karen Joplin. Yes, Chair. Sure. I would just uh, like to add is that some of the Multnomah County questions, if they could just add in a little bit of my question about the federal CHIP program, we can combine some of those. As long as we're covering some of the aspects that the questions kind of canvassed, I'm comfortable with um, going with the questions that the other commissioners are presenting. Okay. So who from Multnomah County? And Commissioner, Commissioner Savas. Yes. This is Deborah Kapori from Multnomah County. I think that um, if, in the interest of um, if all the commissioners agree that we could give you all the questions to ask, if we've all agreed to them. Because I know that as Commissioner Myers said, we have um, consensus on our on the two questions from Multnomah County. So um, if you would just want to read them instead of figuring out who is supposed to read the question. Okay, that might be a little challenging unless Hood River can send us something right away about what those questions are. Not, not immediately, but very shortly, send me their questions to read unless someone from over the phone would like to ask the question. I... Okay, well, the Hood River questions, the Hood River questions are in the packet. They're in mm -hmm. email form from Heidi Dehart. Oh. 
They're divided into two categories. One is around land use and the other is around um, health care, the Children's Health Insurance Program and OHA. I think if you could spin through there, you'll find them. You could probably combine them into some of your other questions. Okay. I would agree that the land use planning information, this is Bob uh, the land use planning section, that could probably be compressed into one question. That could on uh, okay. three questions there if possible. Uh, and that would be good for that section as far as I'm concerned. Okay, what I'm going to allow everyone to do while uh, I'm going to proceed with um, going down the, the script here and I'm going to let everyone, I'll wait for everyone to hand me a list of the questions which I will read. Uh, so, uh, so in a few minutes I will open the meeting up for public comment, for the public comment period. Uh, this section will be limited to 20 minutes in total. During this section members of the public may come up and provide comments for up to one minute each. Uh, members of the public should start by providing their names and addresses. If you would like to speak, please go ahead and form a line behind the microphone, which is right there. Uh, and once we're done with public comment, we'll move into the opening statements. I have five people signed up for public comment. So I will call up the first one, which is, I'm going to read this as best I can, uh, Brad Lorenz. Lorang. Lorang? Yes. Okay, it's a G. All right. Hi, I'm Brad Lorang. I'm from Cascade Locks, uh, Forest, 400 Forest Lane. I'm a small business owner, um, also have been the mayor. I was on the city council. I am currently the vice president of the port commission. Um, we've known Jeff Helfrich, um, speaking on behalf of Jeff Helfrich. Um, we've known Jeff Helfrich for about 10 years. Um, my wife and I uh, worked with him on a couple of ballot measures as well as a number of other very important issues in our community. Anybody who is familiar, I know that all the county commissioners uh, from Hood River are very familiar with uh, Cascade Locks history. Um, Jeff and I worked together on the city council after a very publicized and uh, uh, recall. So we recalled the majority of the uh, um, city council. And over the next year, Jeff and I and several other concerned citizens worked towards rebuilding what was lost. We lost almost half of our uh, um, city staff, including city manager, the city administrator, or I mean the city uh, um, planner, fire chief. We lost our EMS um, services almost completely, including our mutual aid. So over the next year, we worked towards rebuilding everything that was lost. Jeff was great at being able to roll up his sleeves. Um, he's a fantastic communicator. Um, he was really good at bringing two sides together. Our city was completely split. Um, he brought the two factions together, was good at uh, um, really um, talking to both sides, um, keeping his cool and taking two factions that were completely split and getting consensus and coming out with uh, good incomes. Um, so, um, Jeff, I think, is, uh, would be a real plus for this com um, for District 52. Um, as I said, he's a, um, there's few people that I respect more. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I agree with my man, everyone. We don't have that many speakers, so I guess we could go a little bit longer than one minute. Uh, next up is Dustin Schroeder. This is a little awkward for me. I don't do a lot of public speaking or anything, but uh, my name is Dustin Schroeder. I'm, my address is 18870 Southeast Beatty Road, Sandy, Oregon. Um, I'm, a, I'm here on behalf of Stan Pulliam. Uh, I, can't, I grew up with Stan, went to Sandy High School with Stan. I met Stan when I was about sixth grade playing basketball together. His dad coached us in basketball. Uh, actually played separate teams, different schools, had some rival, rivalry. But uh, anyway, I, um, we're a small business owner here in Clackamas County, Sandy Boring area. Uh, Stan grew up in a home with that ran a small business. Um, I think Stan has the values that represent um, the area I live in here. And uh, I think that he represents like, this district very well for um, the way he, his values and the, and the things he stands for. Um, I just keep it short and sweet. So I, I just think that uh, Stan has the know-how. He's got some experience in the government and the legislature um, early on. And uh, I'd just like to see him appointed to the seat. I think he'd be good for this um, part, you know, multi-county district. And 
That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Next on the list is Tom Yates. Hello, I'm uh, Tom Yates uh, from Hood River, 3546 Avalon Drive, and I'm here to speak on behalf of, of Jeff. Um, I want you to know that uh, District 52 precincts, the precinct people are putting forward the three great candidates who can get the job done in District 52. Um, but here's a question. How many of you would feel comfortable approaching a vehicle that you stopped as a law enforcement person or knocking on the door of a house you know that usually has people inside who are, who are known to have weapons and have uh, previously been arrested uh, f by us for using drugs. Mm -hmm. This has been some part of Jeff's life, including his present duties as a deputy sheriff for Multnomah County. It takes a lot of fortitude to be a policeman. It usually takes a lot of perceptiveness to understand and interact with people from all different walks of life. This is Jeff Helfrich. Jeff uh, has lived in District 52 for the last 10 years. Some of that time he has been a city councilman for Cascade Locks, which included the three-year member of the Mid-Columbia Economic Development Board of Directors. He also served in several other duties, as you uh, county commissioners know well. During his uh, city, during his council years, he also worked to uh, improve leadership and funding for the fire department. For over 25 years uh, in community policing in Portland, 13 of which he was sergeant, he trained new officers, and uh, after improving the recruitment process, brought them on board. Jeff is definitely a public servant. And I believe he would work well across the aisle to make Oregon a better state with his background in accountability, transparency, and fiscal responsibility. Please cast your vote uh, for Jeff Helfrich. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, I have Rick Applegate. Rick Applegate, 73451 East Highway 26. Well, a rhododendron, Oregon. I'm not here to endorse any of the candidates, but I would like to talk to you about Precinct 373, the Mount Hood Precinct, okay? We're a rural community. Mark Johnson was an exceptional legislator for our community. And it was shown, if you look at the numbers from all the election cycles, how important he was to our community. We're a rural community. We need legislators that support everybody in that community. People that are willing to communicate with our, with our community through the media. And uh, I would ask that you look at two things. Experience, experience legislating, and the ability to uh, legislate moderation, moderately. We need, we need to con really work hard at bringing our communities together, not dividing them. And I think that right now, you know, on the national level, this is, it has become really problematic. You can leave our community intact and feeling like we're not an outlier by selecting somebody who's, an exper who's experienced in working with government and who can work for Democrats, Republicans, and independents. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up, I can't read the name entirely, but I can re get the last name of Baker. I'm Grant Baker, uh, 39120 Proctor Boulevard, San Diego, Oregon, and I'm here representing Stan. And uh, I grew up with Stan, you know, me and my family and his family have known each other forever, and uh, Stan's pretty much the true American. I mean, he wants this job, you know, not as a job. He wants it because he wants to 
make a difference. You know, he, all through high school, I mean, this was his goal, was to make a difference with everything about it. And uh, you won't find somebody, you know, more hard-pressed who's looking for some way to get in here to show everyone what he can really do. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak? <coughs> Come on up. Identify yourself, and they'll have the form. You could, after you're done speaking, I'll have you fill out the form. I, didn't fill out the form. I don't. You, you may come up, and, but after you're done speaking, I'll have staff okay. fill up. I'm Fran Mazara, uh, 25901 East Highview Drive, Welches. Uh, I have two questions for the three candidates. Number one, I'd like to know their positions on the Nestle deal and any future of gambling in the gorge. And number two, I'd like to know that they have the education and experience to represent the entire state. Decisions they make in the legislature impact the entire state. And I'd like to see that their background is qualifying to be able to understand the complexity of the issues that impact the state. And your your name is? Fran Bazaar. Fran Bazaar, thank you. Okay, uh, any other comments? Okay. Um, find my place here. Okay, each nominee will have an opportunity to make a two-minute opening statement. The nominees will come up to the table one at a time. Excuse me. As called. Uh, once the opening statements are completed, the nominees, except for Mr. Haney, will be escorted from the room as to not hear the questions being asked during the Q&A session until it is time, their time to come before the commissioners. This action is being taken to ensure a fair, open, and transparent process. After each nominee completes their presentation, they may remain in the room to hear the other nominees. I ask the nominees and the audience to please use the honor system and not text or email the questions being asked to the other nominees outside the room. When it is a nominee's respective turn, they will participate in a Q&A session, each nominee will be given up to two minutes to answer each question from a commissioner. Apparently, I'll be asking the questions in this case. Uh, during the Q&A period, we will vary the order. Well, we're not doing that either. Um, so, uh, order of the questions being asked, so I'm going to strike that. Uh, this is not a public hearing, so no testimony will be received after these Q&A questions. Once all Q&A questions are completed, each candidate will again be called up to the table one at a time and will be asked to make a two-minute closing statement. These will be made in alphabetical order. Clerk Moss will keep the time for all answers and statements. He will show a yellow card uh, when a candidate has 30 seconds left and a red card when time is up. Kevin, could you, or you have displayed those, thank you. <laughs> at the conclusion of the interviews, we will recess if needed. Following that, we will begin deliberations. All commissioners will have a chance to comment during deliberations. Deliber excuse me. Deliberations will alternate by county commission. After comments made are made by all commissioners, I will call for a vote. The votes will be made in alphabetical order, alternating by county commission, ending with the chairs. And again, as chair of the meeting, I will go last. As provided by the Secretary of State, each Clackamas County Commissioner will have 4.4 votes. Each Hood River County Commissioner will have 2.8 votes, and each Multnomah County Commissioner will have 1.8 votes. The votes are weighted to reflect the share of voters or electors in the House District 52 living within each county. The votes will be tallied and recorded. State law says that plurality is needed to appoint. So keep that in mind. It's not a majority that's needed, but a plurality. The person who gets the most votes will be appointed provided that the person's total is at least, at this point, 4.4 votes based on attendance. 14.4 votes. Correction, Commissioner, 14.06 since we have a minus of a Hood River County Commissioner. Okay, so it's 14.06. Things are changing on the fly here. <laughs> if no one receives plurality, that is, if two or more candidates are tied in votes, then I will call for another vote at that time. We will keep doing this until we, there is a, a winner. I will call, I may call for additional deliberations if plurality does not emerge 
And with that, I'm going to open up the meeting. I already did that. Commissioner, if I may, yes, you would be opening uh, for nominees opening statements. Okay, um, I just found that. So it is now time for opening statements uh, to our nominees again. Uh, you have two minutes for your statement. Clerk Moss will show the yellow card when you have 30 seconds remaining. And Mr. Haney, uh, please come up uh, to the table and, uh, and give your opening statement. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Eric Haney. I'm from Hood River, Oregon, and it is truly an honor to be here today to be considered for this position. I'm a father of three from Hood River. I make my family there with my wife, Katie, and all three of our kids attend public uh, schools there in Hood River, where I also attended public schools, as did my wife and, and her father. I'm a lifelong Oregonian. Uh, I love this place, and above all, I want the best for it and its people. I got involved with this race, if you want to call it that. It's been going on for about two weeks. Um, just two weeks ago, I was just a guy in the street. Now here I am talking to all you folks. But I got involved in this because I was encouraged by people I respect to throw my hat in the ring uh, and to put my foot forward as someone who might be able to contribute uh, to our community and to our state. Uh, as a profession, I've been an attorney for almost 20 years, practicing in a law firm in dispute resolution, trial court practice. As a result of that, I think I've gained some knowledge and experience with respect to our legal system and um, how it works. I am in a place economically where, uh, thankfully, that I'm in a position to perhaps contribute back uh, to the society that has done well for me, and I'm also supported by my law partners. Uh, there is actually some history within our law firm of folks doing this. Two of my good friends, um, Brent Barton and Chris Garrett, have served in the Oregon Legislature. And if I were to get the nod, I would be proud to follow in their footsteps and be supporting my, our partners uh, in what is viewed as a public service. Uh, as a lawyer, I had a uh, pro bono practice, and I see I have 30 seconds left. Uh, I will say one of my proudest things about the law practice was receipt of um, the Community Partnership Award from Oregon Legal Aid supporting the list among us. And to answer a question in the back, um, I was a pro bono attorney in the No Casino movement because of what I felt were both uh, environmental and social problems that would come if we had a casino in the, in the Columbia River Gorge. My jobs or my priorities would be jobs, education, fiscal responsibility, and natural resource stewardship. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Haney. Mr. Helfick, if you could please come up and uh, give your opening statement. And could you pronounce your name for me so I can? Helfrich. Helfrich. Okay, so there's no, um, okay, this is misspelled here then. Thank you all for participating in this process. I'd like to thank my wife and my family for their support, my small but mighty executive team, Dr. Brandy Etheridge, and the PCPs for the nomination, uh, Representative Johnson for his mentorship, my friends, my colleagues, for their invaluable letters and support, and those who have come to testify. Thank you again. It's an honor and privilege to be here today vying for the chance to represent our diverse community, House District 52. If appointed, this is a long-term commitment for me. I've been a public servant for over 30 years. Starting in 1987, I joined the United States Air Force, served in the first Gulf War. After four years in my honorable discharge in 1992, or excuse me, in 1992, I joined the Portland Police Bureau. After 25 years of service, I retired as a sergeant. My career in public safety continues today as a patrol deputy in East Multnomah County. Over 10 years ago, we moved to Cascade Locks to be closer to my wife's private medical practice and her family uh, in her hometown of the Dalles. In 2008, I joined the Cascade Locks Budget Committee, then in 2009, the Charter and Comprehensive Plan Review Committees. I then was appointed to the Planning Commission as a Planning Commissioner. In 2011, I began serving as a City Councilor in the, in the City of Cascade Locks, where I served until 2015. As a City Councilor, I served on numerous committees, including the Joint City Port Work Group on Economic Development. I was a member of the Board of Directors for the Mid Columbia Economic Development District, MCED. These and other personal professional experiences have taught me the value of hard work clear, open communication, honesty, and integrity, what equity and action truly means to respect myself and others, the importance of collaboration, the impact of community outreach and engagement. I look forward to working together regardless of party affiliation, demographic status, or perspective. I bring these qualities to the table to work as a team to the betterment of the, our residential and business communities across the diverse district, from rural communities to urban cities. The final goal is to identify, implement quality, effective, 
and efficient economic solutions to address the challenges that the district faces. Thank you for consideration and ultimately your vote and being your choice for Representative House District 52. Thank you, Mr. Helfrich. Mr. Pulliam, please come on up and give your uh, opening statement. Well, uh, good late afternoon, early evening, and welcome uh, to Sandy uh, and to this uh, kind of rather new high school uh, that we have. We're uh, pretty proud of it here, so uh, welcome. You know, as I've been uh, contemplating, thinking about what it would mean to be in the legislature, I've been uh, putting some thought towards my last experience there uh, back in 2003 and then in 2005. You know, in 2003, we entered that legislative session with uh, over $200 million of a budget deficit that we needed to uh, find a, a way to fill. Uh, we were coming, our education system was shortly coming out of the, the SIM-CAM um, uh, requirements and trying to figure out what we were gonna do with, our, with an education system that was struggling and, and how we would put it back on the right path. And we had, uh, we had traffic congestion problems. Uh, so we were trying to, and it later got shepherded through in the 2005 session, we were talking about uh, a transportation package through the legislature. So as I sit before you here today, nearly 15 years later, uh, we are now uh, uh, talking about the exact same issues. The only things that has changed are the zeros. We uh, now enter every legislative session, uh, this last time, 1.8 to 1.6 billion dollars uh, in debt that we were trying to fill uh, going into, in, into the uh, cycle. Uh, we still have an education system that's wildly expensive. Uh, and produces uh, results that I think we all could agree with, we'd like to see better. And uh, we're all still sitting in traffic. Uh, I'll tell you, uh, though, that the one thing that has changed is my life. I've returned home to, to Sandy. I got married. Uh, we bought a home. I, uh, the last eight years, I've worked in commercial insurance, working with small to medium-sized business owners. And uh, my kids are in public school. So the importance of these issues uh, has really risen for me. And, and the, one, the one note that I'd like to say is, is that this gives us all a unique opportunity in this upcoming legislative session. When the issues rise to such a critical mass, we have no option but to work together and to find common solutions to be able to actually solve these great problems. So I'm getting the red uh, stop, but I look forward to your questions. And uh, thank you so much for making it out here today. Thank you, Mr. Pulliam. And uh, thank you all. Uh, I will now ask staff to lead the nominees, except for Mr. Haney, into the other room. Uh, Mr. Haney, if you could please take your seat at the table. And do I have a list of questions? Well, I'm a little confused on the question. Do you have these? From Obama, from Obama, from Obama? So before you, yeah. commissioners, you have the sets of all three questions. The, the Clackamas questions, Multnomah, and Hood River to? On the one sheet. Um, well, within three sheets to choose from of no, how. We're missing one sheet. Which sheet are you missing? I think the Hood River. Well, Hood River just asked for a modification of, of, of one question which is related to land use. Is that correct, Commissioner Joplin? Uh, Commissioner Benton. Oh, Commissioner Benton. Well, we have several questions, and I was just trying to consolidate to get. Uh, Okay, I, I, have, I have your sheet before me, and so your land use question, um, if someone could just read that to me so I can identify the one that you wanted to ask. Uh, I believe Commissioner Joplin made a mention of modifying the Multnomah yeah. County question, I thought. That's correct. Yes, this is Karen. I don't oh, okay. The, oh, oh, I'm the sorry. Multnomah County settled on if they're available right now, but if one of them involves some questions around the health care and one I, I believe they touched on the opioid epidemic. Uh, the question about around the CHIP program and the federal discontinuation and governor's decision to continue from within the OHA budget at least until early spring. Uh, my question is do they, does the candidate agree with that and if so how would they propose to continue that? <clears throat> okay, thank you. All right, so I'm going to ask Commissioner Myron to um, to, to, why don't you ask, I'll, I'll let Commissioner Myron ask that question. Um, and I'll, I'll let you ask, actually, I'll actually let you ask the Multnomah County questions, how that sound? Um, and does Clackamas County have their, my colleagues have their questions narrowed down to three? Yes. Okay, can you just hand me what those are? Because I was handed a list of five, so I'm assuming you want to narrow it to three? I think that we have. Or you want to keep the five? I think we should narrow it to three, and I think Commissioner Humbridge has them mixed out. Do you not? 
I was the one that narrowed it to the five, so select whatever three of yes. those five works for you. I'm, I'm fine with that. I, I, if everyone else is doing three, no, no, we're doing a total of five. That's what I heard. We're doing two, and Clackamas is doing three, and Hood River is piggybacking on yours. It's piggybacking one on ours, but they have a land use question that is their own question. <coughs> So there's six questions. I believe there's six questions total is my understanding of what is happening now. So, so right. two from Multnomah County, three from you, and then one is combined from Hood River with our health care question and one land use question from Hood River. So I circle three, homelessness, I-205, and climate change. Is everybody on our commission good with that? It's fine with me. I'm good with that. I'm good with that. Great. Uh, all right, so uh, Mr. Haney, uh, please note that the time will be kept during your presentation. You have a maximum of two minutes uh, to give an answer to each question. Again, the yellow card will indicate that you have 30 seconds remaining. Timing will start at the conclusion of a commissioner's answer. Question. That should be a question there. Uh, each, each commissioner will have the option of asking one question. In this case, uh, it'll be limited to myself asking the question and Commissioner Myron from Oma County asking. So again, the uh, so I'm going to stop there. So um, I'm going to call upon uh, Commissioner Myron to ask the Mullinette, one Mullinette County question. Um, well, I would, and I would request um, I, I will read our question, and I, I'm not sure how to incorporate um, Commissioner Joplin's question in this. Uh, and it, but I'll read it, and we'll we'll see if we can do that. Okay, so our question is, how should the state respond to uncertainty over federal Medicaid funding, especially given efforts to repeal the Affordable Care Act? Certainly, as it relates to children, uh, we have to put the children first. Uh, if the uh, if if the health care arrangements for children fall fall through, then society falls through. So I would uh, I would be willing to support use of state dollars to support health care for children. I had the impression, based on nothing but Facebook, that uh, there was some federal legislation that was stepping forward. Um, that at least it passed the House of Representatives that was going to support this CHIP, this health care for children. And um, I don't know for certain whether that is going to happen, but uh, I would be encouraged. I would be encouraged by that. Um, and it is very difficult for certain to, uh, to navigate the health care question. And I don't um, pretend to have the answers. Um, but I would uh, very much support uh, health care for children, first and foremost. Um, Medicaid and Medicare are very important, valuable uh, programs, and so uh, I would support the continuation of those as well. Okay. I'll read with one Clackamas County question. Um, homelessness is on the rise in Clackamas County. The homeless county, um, that must be count. Yeah, uh, so I'm going to correct that. The homeless count from earlier this year showed nearly 2,300 people homeless living in the county which is up 4.4% since 2015. What do you think is the right way to tackle this problem? Well, I, I don't think that necessarily throwing more money at it blindly is going to be the solution, candidly. Uh, if, if there were proven programs, perhaps, uh, I would suggest uh, working to improve employment as best we can, economic development to help those who who need, um, who do need uh, employment to obtain employment, if that's the issue. And certainly, if there's children involved, we, we have uh, existing resources that can be supported uh, even better, uh, women's uh, shelters, children's shelters, things of those sort. Um, homelessness problem is uh, certainly a big problem, and uh, I think that each locality is also in a position to speak to its needs uh, particularly. So. Uh, if there are certain areas that might have one solution that would work, then we should we should try to drive local solutions as best we can. Uh, a top-down solution won't necessarily 
uh, work best. I would support grassroots movements from the, from the, from the local level. Uh, listening to our local uh, county uh, or local municipal um, representatives for what will work best to, to solve those kinds of problems. Um, our, our second question actually was was basically about housing and homelessness and strategies for addressing so okay. I think we covered that. All right. Uh, also I'll jump to the next question here. The state transportation package passed during the last legislative session did not provide funding to fix the I-205 bottleneck between Stafford Road and the Abernathy Bridge in Oregon City. This is a top priority for the county. Would this be a priority of yours and if so how would you help? Uh, I have had a chance to speak with some of the Clackamas County commissioners on that topic. I do understand that's a top priority for them. Uh, so I would support that. Uh, there's, I've, I've experienced the gridlock. I know that gridlock is bad for commerce, and if they need that, we should support that. Um, I had understood from Representative Johnson that the, the transportation package would eventually, or the way it's designed would eventually lead to solutions that would at least help. So. Um, it seems to be a disconnect a little bit from what I'm hearing there from perhaps what I'm hearing here. But if there is, in fact, a need to, uh, for further help to make that happen, I absolutely would support that. Because as I understand it, that is, that is one of the top priorities for Clackamas County. And as such, it would be one of my top priorities. Commissioner okay. Myron, do you have any other questions you'd like to ask? Um, I can ask a reverse okay. plan response question. Okay. Uh, this is from my colleagues um, in Hood River. Uh, Senate Bill 100 was a groundbreaking piece of legislation that created a model for the rest of the country when it was passed. It has changed very little in the ensuing 40 plus years. What is your vision for the future of land use planning in Oregon, um, including changes or tweaks you think would improve the current system? And then how do you view the differences between the land use planning needs of urban versus rural Oregon? I think uh, Oregon, Oregon's land use system has been an experiment. It has been uh, one of the most unique approaches, I think, in the states, or in, the, in the country, certainly when it was enacted. And I, uh, in generally speaking, am in favor of land use. I think we need to plan for how we're going to develop our communities and not have the sprawl that we see in California. So as sort of just a moral statement, I support land use. We did have Measure 37 and then Measure 49 in the past 15 years. I think uh, I, I appreciated the spirit of those, which was to say, hey, we landowners were sort of caught by surprise by this. We need to have some kind of compensation for it. I think sadly, and have been, having been a lawyer who's worked on these matters, uh, the people who grab the promise of Measure 37 and Measure 49 have been let down because they've been faced with nothing but legal bills trying to still even today work through a very cumbersome process. Um, I would say what I would encourage uh, if I were in the legislature, uh, the Oregon Court of Appeals uh, is one of the busiest and clogged court systems in the country and that is where uh, the final resting place is often for land use disputes. I would like to see another panel of judges appointed to the uh, Oregon Court of Appeals to get the throughput faster. It can take two and a half years to litigate through uh, the Oregon Court of Appeals. And some have even said the court doesn't even exist because it takes so long. Uh, with respect to land use, the connection here is we need to have very clear, uh, clear rules that people can understand how to, uh, to understand what will be allowed and what will not, a depoliticized process that focuses on rules so that property values can be set and determined. Because when we have the changes, it sort of becomes a political process and you have the lucky winners with their land. If people can understand, if the market can understand what, what certain properties are gonna be worth versus others uh, and have, a, have an enforceable system with a, a fast paced resolution, which generally speaking, Luba, is, is very fast, so I'll, I'll stop there. I've got the red sign, sorry. Okay. So this is the uh, fifth question. Uh, climate change legislation is set to be a top priority issue in the 2018 legislative session. Oregon's forested lands are important in the discussion given their role in sequestering carbon. Over the past year, Clackamas County has been focused on efforts to make Oregon a nationwide leader in the production of cross-laminated timber. Would these issues be a priority for you? And if so, how do you view your role in helping to achieve that success? The color of Oregon is green. 
and I am proud of that. And I would very much like to be part of uh, an environmentally conscious, progressive Republican agenda that um, will make that green proud. So uh, we have uh, we have wonderful timberland here, and we need to be stewards of that timberland. I, I, don't take me too far. Uh, we can have wonderful jobs from um, from our timber, and so. Stewardship involves not just preservation, but, uh, but economically mindful use, uh, but still stewardship. So I would uh, definitely count myself not amongst the climate deniers. I think that uh, climate change is real. Uh, I think the science backs that up. And I would be uh, proud to be part of a, a group of progressive Republicans advancing uh, environmental causes in our state. Thank you, Mr. Haney. Uh, you may have a seat. And uh, would staff please bring up Mr. Helfrich. Mr. Chair, were we going to ask six questions? Was there an alternate question? I thought we saw, oh, I'm sorry, uh, pardon, uh, Mr. Haney, come back. I thought we settled on five. I'm mistaken. So you have one? By all means, is there, is there a sixth question? Yes. OK, cool. So, Thank you all for thank you all for bearing with us. Yes. My apologies. It will be a seamless process. Even, sorry. <laughs> so, um, an immigration question, and that's: Do you support Oregon's policy of not allowing local or state resources to be used for immigration enforcement? That that issue is not one I've ever considered or thought about. So I would have to think think that through. Uh, I think that. We do need to have immigration reform. I think that primarily happens at the national level. I'm, I'm at times disappointed by the tone that I hear with respect to that issue. That's not a tone. The tone you hear in Washington is not the tone you'd hear from me. But I think that um, on a national level, we do need uh, to have immigration reform uh, so that we can have an efficient path to allow people who want to come here to be citizens. I think it is doing our citizenry that exists and the future citizenry that could exist a disservice if we don't have a clear path to citizenship for them. Um, but your specific question is, do I support the, uh, the, the question is, do I support the, is it the, the ban on use of state dollars for immigration enforcement? Is, is, that, what the, is that what the issue is? Oregon has a state law and there's a policy that you don't lo allow state or local resources to be used for federal immigration enforcement. Do you agree with that policy? Um, it seems to me that immigration should be a federal issue. Uh, so uh, again, it's not an issue I've thought through, but that sounds to me like the right position, particularly since you then would have different states with different budgets and different perspectives. And immigration needs to be a national issue. It needs to be uh, resolved. Uh, in a way, like I said, that, that creates passive citizenships um, through a lawful process that people can follow. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Haney. Uh, now you may have a seat. Uh, would staff please bring up Mr. Helfrich? I appreciate the audience patience, and as now I think we have this sorted out now. Think, Six yeah, questions, sorry. and we know well, the questions are. Well oiled machine. <laughs> Practice makes perfect. <laughs> I said I could stay, yes, okay. you may have a seat. Yes. <laughs> Unless you want to go get me a coffee. That's called a Uh, Mr. Helfrich, please note that the time will be kept during your presentation. You have a maximum of one and a half minutes to give an answer to each question. Is that the same as the last? Two minutes. Two minutes. It was two minutes. Okay, so the script. Yeah, you're getting shorted here, so I'm going to change that to two. You have uh, two minutes to give an answer to each question. Again, the yellow card will indicate that you have 30 seconds remaining. Timing will start at the conclusion of uh, Commissioner's uh, question. Each commissioner will have the option of asking one question. In this case, myself and Commissioner Myron will be asking the three three questions each for a total of six. Commissioner Myron. First question is about health care. And uh, that is, how should the state respond to uncertainty over the federal Medicaid funding, especially given efforts to repeal, repeal the Affordable Care Act? 
So that's a uh, subject that's fairly dear to my wife's heart being in a medical practice, but overall it's, it's important for a community. I think that right now Governor Brown has uh, orders to have this funded, the, the, the uh, funding for April for the Children Health Protection Act. That needs to happen. I know there's some concern about how the money was spent, some other, um, I think $300 million was spent. Let that process work. Let the person that just took charge of that, let them go through and see how these mistakes were made and correct those actions. But overall, our responsibility of a government is to help make sure people are, are taken care of, and that's one of those things, is to figure out a way we can do that with the insurance to do that. I'm fiscally conservative, so I would like to see how we're, we can be more efficient in other items in the government to use some of that money to offset those costs, but ultimately we may have to uh, look for other revenue sources for that. Thank you. Okay. Homelessness is on the rise in Clackamas County. The homeless count from earlier this year showed nearly 2,300 ho people homeless living in the county, which is up 4.4 percent since 2015. What do you think is the right way to tackle this problem? I think I have probably one of the more unique perspectives on homelessness. Uh, for serving in Portland for 25 years, I saw that problem grow. I saw that problem grow after the Occupy event. I have worked with our, uh, when I was with the police bureau, worked with programs to address those. That was the front line of that, and I found that some people want help, some people don't want help. We can only help those who want it. But how do we get that best help to them? I think if you look at the Community Re Reinvestment Justice Act, using that model and using that type of model to go towards uh, looking at the homeless issues, we can use that model to do that. However, it needs to be done at the local control, not at the, the state control. Allow those funds there, get, let the state bring some of the subject matter experts for that. Allow them to um, help guide the local leadership of the communities that are there so they understand. They under, the communities that are there, the leadership in those communities, they know what the problems are, but they may not know how quite to sl uh, the solutions to them, but if we have experts in that can help with that, I think that's the best direction to go, is using that model. Um, I ask a question about land use planning, uh, and this is actually from Hood River. Uh, and Senate Bill 100 was a groundbreaking piece of legislation that created a model for the rest of the country when it was passed. It has changed very little in the ensuing 40 plus years. So this question is, um, you know, what your vi about your vision for the future of land use planning in Oregon, including changes or tweaks that you think would improve the current system and how you view the differences between land use planning needs of urban versus rural Oregon. I was a planning commissioner for a few years when I was in Cascade Locks. So I really didn't know what I was getting into, so I started <laughs> reading it. It's like reading half page after page after page. It's like a little overwhelming. Um, I'm going to go back to local control and local uh, avail ability to direct what they believe their land should be used. I think there should be overarching control, that 80,000 foot level. But once you get past that, here's some basic rules we want to follow. And then beyond that, down at the local level, allow them, the local leadership, to decide what they want the communities to look like, how they're going to go about doing it. You can talk about short-term rentals. You can talk about auxiliary dwelling units. Those are different um, issues for counties or small rural communities than they are in the city. There are distinct differences in how they go about doing that. Those two, short-term rentals and the um, auxiliary dwelling units, those I think are good good starting points to, or at least the auxiliary dwelling units when you're out in where we live at, when affordable housing is a question, that also can help offset maybe some of that, but the other part of that, that also is, help, is an economic driving engine too because it, it's that cascade effect of helping out the economy by, by providing a, a reasonable place for people to live uh, that's affordable, but then that also allows the landowner that has that, they can spend money on other things too, which helps that drive that economy uh, in the, the local area. The state transportation package passed during the le past legislative session uh, did not provide funding to fix the I-205 bottleneck between Stafford Road and the Abernathy Bridge in Oregon City. This is a top priority for the county. Uh, would this be a priority of yours? And if so, how would you help? So when it comes to infrastructure upgrades or that transportation package, that's an issue statewide. We have kicked the can down the road numerous times in trying to figure out how, one, we're going to pay for it, and two, what that's going to look like. The, the bill was passed, figure out the funding sources. That is an economic driving engine. I think that's important for all the communities that I serve in District 52 because goods and services coming out. What's in Hood River is not the same as what's in Clackamas or in Multnomah County because the two of them have access to those freeways, waterways, and rail systems where Clackamas County doesn't. So I think it's important to recognize that Clackamas County needs to have those funds to them and get, get the projects working and moving it forward. Once again, I'm going to go back to government transparency and being fiscally responsible with that. 
look at our programs, look what's in place, look what is working and what's not working, and then if we're able to save money in some programs, dedicate those resources to that. If, in fact, we can't find the resources appropriate for that, we have to generate new revenue resources, that is my job, your job, everybody else's job at making the laws, to go out to the constituents and say, this is how we're doing it, this is why we have to do it, because if we don't explain it, then everybody is up in arms about it. But if we take the time to talk and communicate with people and tell them our vision and what their vision was to us when they put us in these positions, that's the most important thing of that part of that package. My final question is on immigration, and that's, do you support Oregon's policy of not allowing local or state resources to be used for immigration enforcement? That is a question that's answered in the ORS. It is prohibited <laughs> for law enforcement to do that. There's, there's a reason for that, so I continue that. Okay. Uh, last question. Climate change legislation is set to be the top priority issue in the 2018 legislative session. Oregon's forested lands are important in the discussion, given their role in sequestering carbon. Over the past year, Clackamas County has been focused on efforts to make Oregon a nationwide leader in the production of cross-laminated timber. Would these issues be a priority for you? And if so, how do you view your role in helping to achieve success? That is one of the, I think, outside the box thinking that we need to have in government. What are other ways we can use our forest services or use the other resources that we have naturally? But that also helps create jobs. That helps create uh, an economy. To answer the question, quite frankly, I support that and I continue to support that through the, the legislative agenda because that is showing how we can manage our forces appropriate, force appropriately, getting the federal government on board with that and showing them how we can thin, how we can use certain trees for that. I talked with uh, Commissioner uh, Ken Hubbardson about that and he gave me great detail about that. And when I was in, um, actually when I was uh, working in Portland, I drove by a building and I mentioned to Ken about it and I said, hey, do you know that about this building you're making out of glam loot beams? Yeah, it's part of the project. And I was, it was a company that had pointed that out to me. And I think it's a reasonable way to go about doing business because it cuts down on mining, it cuts down on uh, using our other resources for cement, steel, and it lessens our carbon footprint for the area. And so that's a good thing. And then um, beyond that, do you export those and have that better regional picture on how the export goes through the West Coast and then through the Pacific Rim for the uh, selling of our product? Great. Thank you, Mr. Helfrich. If you could uh, take a seat. And uh, I'll ask staff to bring up Mr. Pullion. Uh, please note that time will be kept during your presentation. You have a maximum of two minutes to give an answer to each question. Again, the yellow card will indicate that you have 30 seconds remaining. Timing will start at the conclusion of the commissioner's question. Each commissioner, in this case myself and Commissioner Myron, will be asking the questions. Uh, timing will start at the conclusion, uh, again, of those questions. Uh, each commissioner will have, uh, or you'll have the option, never mind, striking that as well. <laughs> So with that, Commissioner Romayer, you can begin. Hi. Hi, good evening. Um, so my first question is regarding health care. And uh, the question is, how should the state respond to uncertainty over federal Medicaid funding, especially given efforts to repeal, repeal the Affordable Care Act? Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, with everything going on in the federal government right now, there's you know, obviously that, that entire issue has just the noise level of it is, has has grown tremendously, and 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 we had a conversation you know, in your office a little bit about healthcare, and uh, you know I'm uh, someone that believes you know especially when you're thinking about uh, here in Oregon what we're doing, uh, you know we, we were a leader uh, in in the healthcare industry for a lot of years with the Oregon Health Plan. And I think that we are best uh, when we are innovative here in Oregon and when we're leading the way and when we're taking care of each other. And so uh, I believe that we should try to localize and, and get the waivers and stuff to be able to handle that uh, here in Oregon. Uh, and then when talking about the funding coming down, um, you know, I, I think it would, um, it, uh, it, 
you know, I'm not, I'm not quite sure where the funding is going to be, uh, if, if it's going to come down from the federal government in Oregon or not. Uh, I think we have to plan uh, as if it's not going to come. I think we've seen us do that rather successfully with our transportation program that came through. We're counting on just about zero federal dollars on that. Uh, and so I think here in Oregon, we've got to look out for ourselves here locally and, uh, and then just and then hope and lobby and, and work with the federal government as much as we can uh, to, to get what's for us. Homelessness is on the rise in Clackamas County. The homeless count from earlier this year showed nearly 2,300 people homeless um, living in, in the county, which is up 4.4 percent since 2015. What do you think is the right way to tackle this problem? Yeah, it's a huge problem. Uh, so as I, uh, I live here in Sandy, as we've talked about, and I commute every day uh, to Portland. That's uh, uh, where my career is and, and where I work. So I'm uh, verily familiar with, uh, with the problems in Portland. Uh, we see it uh, in Gresham, and we're, we're actually starting to, you know, slightly see it here in Sandy a little bit. Uh, I work uh, uh, primarily uh, niche practice in nonprofits uh, for insurance, what I do for a living. So I get an opportunity all the time to talk about their mission, the programs, what they do, uh, risk mitigation. And one thing I continually hear is, is that nobody knows who's on first, second, or third. And, and there's a lot of efforts that sometimes are being double layered. Uh, there's a lot of effort sometimes that, uh, that there's a gap that needs to be filled. And so I, I'm someone, I, I, I would propose something along the lines of a homelessness czar. Uh, somebody who could come in and, and coordinate all the efforts of the different nonprofits and the, and the state uh, um, health and human services. And I know the, uh, the, the counties are involved in the city. But we need somebody who's that's their primary focus is looking at all the services available and, and working with uh, nonprofits and government entities uh, collectively to try to address this problem. And it's a, it's a human problem. Uh, you know, I, uh, I'm a conservative. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, I got to tell you, uh, when Bernie Sanders says that we are the, uh, you know, the wealthiest nation in the history of the world, uh, what are we doing? Uh, when you drive through Portland and you look at the homelessness problem, and you look at some of the problems that we face, what are we doing? And, uh, and, and it's my philosophy that we need to have people, both parties, come together to start solving these major issues. Thank you. This next question um, comes from Hood River, and it's regarding land use planning. Uh, Senate Bill 100 was a groundbreaking piece of legislation that created a model for the rest of the country when it was passed. It has changed very little in the ensuing 40 plus years. What is your vision for the future of land use planning in Oregon, including changes or tweaks you think might improve our current system, mm -hmm. and how you view the differences between land use planning needs of urban versus rural Oregon? Well, you know, it, the creation of Metro, I think, was a beautiful vision by Governor Tom McCall. And what, it, what he was hoping to thrive uh, to do with that process is to allow proper planning as we grow and with Oregon getting population increasing, you know, he was, he was the governor famed for a fight with California to come visit here and not stay here. Uh, so he was very, uh, he, was, he was all about urban planning and how, what we were going to look like as a state uh, uh, looking forward. Uh, but with that, I think we have lost some of the control from our local governments uh, that they have had to and uh, they've they they have not been able to make the decisions that are important to them and to their communities and the different the differences between the two are actually starting to meld together uh, because when you're talking about uh, a housing uh, a crisis and problem in portland and affordability issues in portland uh, a lot of people are leaving their communities a long-term residents of communities some newer and they're and they're and the urban sprawl is coming out here uh, it's coming out here to, to sandy and boring and uh, it's coming out a little bit to Hood River. Uh, Hood River also has a bit of a tourism issue that's changing. But with these populations and with uh, uh, the mass growth, you've got, you've got farmers and agriculture out here and, and they're going back and forth with the realtor sometimes. And, and, uh, and a lot of people don't want to uh, set up their home and their family living next to uh, a bunch of fertilized pasture land. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of issues that come out here as we grow as communities uh, where we got to strive to kind of hold on to who we are uh, but we also as a community need to come together because the more local we get, the less partisan it is because we're all about our hometown, our community, why we all came here. We all live in our communities for the same joined reasons. And, uh, and, and, and I say that to say, 
So let's have those people at the most local level be making the decisions about how they grow uh, with, with, uh, with overall encompassing on how we are growing as a state. I think that's what Metro strives to do. I think they're a little uh, overhanded in how they do it, quite frankly. And I'd like to see a little bit more of the power uh, be transferred back to the local communities. The state transportation package passed during the past legislative session did not provide funding to fix the I-205 <coughs> bottleneck between Stafford Road and the Abernathy Bridge in Oregon City. This is a top priority for the county. Would this be a priority for you? And if so, how would you help? Well, considering I uh, sat on Staff Stafford Road for about an hour um, the other day, and uh, making me late for a, for a meeting uh, that then actually made me late uh, to another meeting, and then made me late to go see my kids uh, to, to tuck them into bed. So it's something that uh, I mentioned just a little bit ago. Is I'm 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 one of those people out there. I'm uh, uh, I'm commuting from Sandy and into Portland uh, on a daily basis, and I do a lot of business in Clackamas and back and forth. So I, I see the traffic issues. I see after an ice storm when we're driving through Boring, you got to swerve around the Grand Canyon. Uh, I, I'd hate to be a police officer these days. I mean, it's somebody driving intoxicated or they swerve in to miss a pothole. Uh, so we have local issues on our roads and our freeways, and then we have congestion as you get onto the freeway. And, and, and I feel it's really important to have someone who's local and understands these issues, and it actually affects them on a daily basis, who's also collaborative and wants to work, uh, and, and work as a liaison between the state and, and local governments and local communities to make sure that their transportation needs are being satisfied. And, and I have the experience to do it. I was the legislative director for Senator Bruce Starr in the 2005 session. Uh, we worked side by side. He was the uh, co-vice chair. We had shared committees at that time uh, with Senator Rick Metzger from the area, actually, old state senator from this area. And uh, uh, myself, Ryan Tribbett, who was his uh, legislative director, we worked side by side on that transportation committee. I, I, there's more times than I can count that, that Senator Metzger and, and Senator Starr were sitting in the same office with us and we were, and we were trying to figure it out together. So. Uh, I want to be a representative for, uh, uh, for the entire district, but I, I definitely see the concerns in Clackamas County, and I believe I can be effective in uh, uh, being a seat at the table. Thank you. Immigration. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we're tackling the light topics here. Yes. Um, do you support Oregon's policy of not allowing local or state resources to be used for federal immigration enforcement? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm quite frankly, I'm, I'm concerned about the policy. Um, and, and the reason I'm concerned about the policy is uh, I'm going to back up real quick and just say the federal government has completely let us down on our immigration laws um, uh, throughout the country. You know, in the, in the late 80s when President Reagan uh, passed through a, uh, a, you know, many call it an amnesty bill to, to grant amnesty, the, the next wave for that compromise and that negotiation was to reform our visa program. And quite frankly, both parties have, have let us down in, in revising that. So getting to the sanctuary uh, issue, my concern with the sanctuary status is is that what, what happens if the federal government actually does shut off the federal funding that comes into our local communities? It makes up one third of our state budget um, here in Oregon. Uh, it makes up uh, uh, over $700 million a year. It comes into the city of Portland, my own county area. These are critical services. This is a lot of money that we have to, that we have to fund that we'd have to find elsewhere. Is it a false threat from the federal government? Well, I mean, they have done it before. I mean, they did it uh, with the drinking age with a lot of states. Uh, that would not rise the, uh, the age to, to 21. As a result, they cut off federal funding, and those communities are still struggling today um, to, to fix their transportation system. So uh, do, I, do I like the idea of, of, of some of the tactics that ICE is using? Absolutely not. Uh, but at the same time, and when we got such huge infrastructure needs here, we got education needs, we were just uh, asked a question earlier about health insurance. Uh, yeah, I mean, I am, I'm extremely nervous about our federal funding being cut off. And, and uh, that would be a concern for me when thinking about that issue. Mr. Chair, I, I'm not clear. You didn't answer the question. I, what, could you re-answer the question, um, yeah. Commissioner Myron? So the question is, uh, yes, do you support oh. Oregon's policy, yeah. of, which is its current policy, of not allowing local or state resources to be used for that ICE um, federal law enforcement? Oh, yeah, well, I, I think I'd pose using local resources to help, the, to help ICE. Am I, am I understanding the question correctly, are using our, our resources to help ICE? Or are you talking about the sanctuary state law and the sanctuary cities and counties? I, I guess I don't know where I you're think, I think those are sim 
Yeah, yes, and, and the, yeah. the the law basically says you can't use local dollars through the mm -hmm. local police or or county sheriff's department to uh, support ICE in their efforts. And so that's the question: Do you agree with with that current law in Oregon? Uh, it, yeah. So as as far as the current law goes, I'm I'm okay with that with, with that current law as far as using our, our local resources, not allowing our local resources okay. to help out that program. Uh, but where I, I, I start to dive from that is where the interpretation of that becomes of, of, of sanctuary and becomes that of, of not sharing information with ICE and with the federal government in their efforts. You can't have it both ways. Do you? Do well, then, you then, it, then it would be no. Then it would be no. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Last question. <clears throat> Climate change legislation is set to be the top priority in the 2018 legislative session. Oregon's forested lands are important in the discussion given their role in sequestering carbon. Over the past year, Clackamas County has been focused on efforts to make Oregon a national, or excuse me, a nationwide leader in the production of cross-laminated timber. Would these issues be a priority for you? And if so, how do you view your role in helping to achieve success? Yeah, it, it would be a, uh, it'd be a huge priority for me. I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of cross-laminated uh, lumber and what it could mean for Oregon very much uh, meets our brand uh, as who we are. It meets our culture. Uh, Oregon is, is an innovative uh, technology. Uh, when you think about the people's perceptions of our state uh, here locally, nationally, and around the world, it's with our natural resources. And I think there's a real opportunity, especially with the uh, wildfires that happened here recently, to, do, to work together uh, to bring people of all political stripes together to discuss ways that in a, in a healthy forest management way that we can manage our forests at the same time uh, use the material that we're taking out of those forests uh, for cross-laminated lumber. And I know that we need, we need some programs in the state to help incentivize that. Um, the industry, I've been encouraged. I, I, I know that there's, uh, there was one that was very prominent uh, in trying to lead the way there. And uh, for conversations that I've personally had, there seems to be a lot more locally here in this industry uh, that want to jump right into it head first. Um, and so I, I see no reason why we wouldn't. And it would be a top priority for me um, in the legislature. It would be something that I think that we could use as a model of, of the state and, and, and local governments working together to do something pretty innovative and, quite frankly, pretty cool. Thank you, Mr. Pulliam. You can take a seat. Oh, it's five. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> six. Oh, was it six? six? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they went fast. Yeah. Okay, it's now time for closing statements. Uh, to our nominees, again, you have two minutes for your statement. Clerk Moss will show the yellow card when you have 30, sec 30 seconds remaining. We will proceed in alphabetical order. So, Mr. Haney, come up to the table and give yours. Commissioners, uh, again, I thank you for your time, and I'm prepared to respect whatever decision you make today. I will say, uh, with respect to my potential role in the Oregon Legislature, as I said at the end of my opening statement, I have four priorities. Jobs, education, fiscal responsibility, and natural resource stewardship. Uh, on jobs, economic development for rural Oregon, I think, is very important. Uh, I've, through this process, learned about the priority of Clackamas County relative to two I-205s widening, and so I've heard that that becomes my priority. Uh, with respect to land use in Oregon, uh, frankly, another topic uh, for jobs, I also appreciate the notion of local control and having clear rules so that it's not just the wealthy with lawyers who can get things through, but it's just regular folks who can get things through. Education, we need to have sustainable, reliable education. I would like to fund education first, not last. Education is the bedrock of our society, public education. And I believe in that, and I'm proud of the Republicans' last biennium supporting education the way they'd like to, and I'd like to continue that. Uh, fiscal responsibility. One thing we didn't talk about today is PERS. It's a difficult topic, but if I understand the numbers right, uh, the state of Oregon is currently in the hole on an actuarial sort of anticipated basis, something to the tune of almost $20 billion, which is, I think, the equivalent of an entire year's budget for the state. Uh, there's a there's a collision here coming unless we find a bar bipartisan solution to solve that which I think does involve having uh, public retirees having at least some skin in the game which isn't popular but perhaps a necessity uh, we need to solve that problem because the state of Oregon is not going to be able to afford education public safety 
if we cannot um, find a bipartisan, fair, and appropriate solution to that giant budget problem. <coughs> the governor's working on that. I like some of what came out of her panel uh, uh, document uh, a few weeks ago. I didn't like all of it, but I support the notion that we all need to work together on PERS. Uh, and finally, natural resource stewardship. The fires are bringing us together, and we need to uh, mind our forests. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Haney. Mr. Helfrich. There we go. It's gone pretty fast. All right. Thank you, commissioners and people in attendance today. <clears throat> We've talked about a lot of issues facing communities across our district and state. I'm here to say that I look forward to representing and collaborating with our county leadership, other community leaders, and members. I bring to this position a wealth of knowledge and experience that will serve the district well as I continue Representative Johnson's work in understanding and appreciating the diversity of the district and tackling the three E's, the economy, economic development, education in our schools, and related to workforce development and environmental stewardship. I also vow to work on improving our community's health and public safety services to children, veterans, seniors, and ensure we're prepared for emergency and disasters, and increasing government transparency, accountability, and fiscal responsibility. We must understand one size does not fit all. The, all the communities have similar issues and priorities, and approaching to address them ver varies. The communication, collaboration, and reasonable compromise goes further than being at odds because at the end of the day, it's about what we're doing best for our communities. One issues, when, once issues are identified, communication is in place, we must have a collaborative across the, uh, be collaboration across the community and dedicated to addressing the identities, uh, excuse me, dedication to addressing the identified issues effectively, efficiently, and economically for the betterment of our communities, district, and region in the state. I'm committed to working every day hard for our district, being sure that the outside interests stay where they belong, and I'm available to hear and respond to our community's needs. I am where you live. I am truly representative of the people of the district. I'm committed to working together to collaborate, communicate, and advocate on behalf of our diverse people in our district. Thank you for your consideration and your ultimate vote and being your choice for House District Representative 52. Thank you, Mr. Helfrich. Mr. Pulliam. <coughs> Well, thank you again for your time today, everyone. And, uh, you know, when I started this process, I was extremely uh, nervous, you know. Uh, I've been out of the process for about eight years. Uh, you see the issues uh, getting highlighted uh, to extreme uh, points on our, on our media. And you're told that, you know, the partisan divide has never been greater than ever before. And through this process, which is actually a pretty neat process of starting with the party folks and working your way through to a nonpartisan county uh, commission of the district, uh, what I have found is actually broad consensus. Um, the Oregon spirit really does live. Um, you know, everyone is in this for the same reasons, with the same collective goals, and we just tend to have different ways of, of going about it and different philosophical points on the way that we tackle many of these uh, issues. You know, to go back to how this all uh, started uh, here today as we were talking about phone calls, you know, and who was calling who. Well, I, I don't know about any of that. But I certainly hope that when you uh, were checking your emails and getting phone calls uh, from anyone on my behalf, that you saw a broad spectrum of Oregonians from uh, both sides of the aisle, representing different constituency groups uh, and communities. And I am uh, proud of that. I have spent the last 15 years uh, longer, if you count some uh, really neat relationships that I built in college, uh, uh, with, with Oregonians and with political leaders uh, from all stripes. And I've uh, been able to show that I'm effective. I, I, I spearheaded some legislation through the legislature that 23 co-sponsors uh, from both parties, uh, 12 uh, Democrats, 11 Republicans. Might have been reversed. Uh, it might, might have been reversed. Might have missed it by one. Uh, but I, I try to get people around a table to talk about what our goals are, what your concerns are, and see where we can meet in the middle. Uh, you know, President Reagan used to say that somebody who agrees with me 60% uh, of the time is my friend. And, uh, you know, maybe we got to get closer to 50-50 sometimes, or maybe a little less. But I'll tell you, I, I think uh, we need to move uh, forward and, uh, and come together to solve these problems because we're Oregon. Uh, you know, we're, we're innovative. We're, we're, we're you know, we're, we lead the way, uh, whether it's the Columbia Gorge Freeway uh, or the Bottle Bill. Uh, so let's uh, let's come together and do these things. And thank you so much again for coming out and and this whole process has been wonderful. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, actually, thank you all for your 
your uh, closing comments and uh, your participating in this, uh, this uh, uh, process. Um, we're at the point where we might want to take a recess. I'll throw that out or we can continue on. Um, if we do take a recess, let's limit it to five minutes. Um, legal counsels advise me that, you know, if we gather and discuss things that we can create a quorum. So I, I would I just ask you to avoid uh, gathering in groups larger than five or frankly, from my perspective, any groups at all. Um, sure. Sure. If, you're asking, if you're asking for uh, a break, does everybody need a break? Uh, I'm. I'm looking around for nods. Does any? I'm good. I'm good. Okay. We're all good. So we want to continue. I'm good. Yes. Okay. So we will. Uh, okay. Great. Well, you guys can do whatever you yeah. want. Yeah. <laughs> we all have to see. Yeah. We can't. We can't see y'all. <laughs> okay. So uh, we'll go into. Big, we'll start to go into deliberations at, in th at this moment. Uh, but again, I'd like to go over. Uh, how the process works. Like the question and answers, the order of deliberations and comments will alternate by county commission, uh, but the three county chairs and the meeting chair will comment last. After comments are made by all commissioners, I will call for a vote. The votes will be made in alphabetical order, alternating by county commission, ending with the county chairs and then the meeting chair. As provided by the Secretary of State, again, each or Clackamas County each Clackamas County Commissioner has 4.4 votes. Each Hood River County Commissioner will have 2.8 votes. Each Multnomah County Commissioner will have 1.8 votes. And I believe uh, plurality was 14.06, correct? Uh, the votes are weighted to reflect the share of the voters or electors in each house district, and the votes will be tallied and recorded. State law says that plurality is needed to a point, so keep that in mind. It's not a majority that's needed, but a plurality. The person who gets the most votes will be appointed, provided that the person receives at least 14.06. If no one receives plurality, that is if two or more candidates are tied for the most votes, then I will call for another vote at that time. We will keep doing this until there's a winner. Uh, I may call for additional deliberations if plurality does not emerge after that. Are there any questions? So I'm taking it we can't flip a coin in the taste of the time. <laughs> I don't believe a coin is anywhere in this uh, in this script. I don't think so. Just, <laughs> just being facetious. <laughs> so uh, with that, we'll go into deliberations. I've got, I think I've got the right attendance list. I know it's changed because we had some commissioners arrive today that we didn't anticipate, and I think we have a commissioner that didn't arrive. So I think I've got the list correct. So I will start with Commissioner Myron. Thank you. I, of course I go first um, so this this is a really difficult decision um, the, it's a tremendous responsibility one that uh, I know I and I know my other fellow commissioners take extremely seriously over the past uh, you know couple of weeks we've gotten or I've received a lot of um, emails, phone calls from, from people supporting each of these really qualified, excellent candidates. Um, I've had the opportunity to speak with each of them uh, in person, and I have been uh, nothing short of impressed uh, with each one. They all have great backgrounds and experiences. All are very personable. Um, and they've all demonstrated in their careers a real dedication to serve others and their communities. Um, I know that each one would serve us well and serve their district well in the House of Representatives. All that being said, I do have to make a decision. Um, and so I will be, uh, I don't know if this is the right place to do it, I will be casting my uh, vote today for uh, Jeff Hellrich. Um, I, what, I, what I really appreciated um, during my conversations and what I have heard today um, from him and from others is a, a real collaborative approach in bringing sides together and in this time of um, divisiveness in our country and even in our state, I, that quality is, a, is, um, is so valuable. Uh, I also appreciate that frontline experience that uh, he brings in law enforcement. Uh, I work on the front line as an emergency physician, and um, you, you see things in that role. You see how our policies impact people in the real world, and um, I, I think that is an ex really 
excellent background to bring to lawmaking. Uh, and I just by, was very impressed by your knowledge of all the issues we discussed today, uh, which kind of ran the gamut. Uh, and so, very difficult decision. Thank you all for being here, and uh, I, I think that's it. Okay. Commissioner Benton. I, I would also like to thank all of the uh, individuals and appreciated all of, the, uh, of their statements as well as the answers to the questions. Uh, very difficult, um, you know, in the short time that we have here, as well as uh, some of the questions are fairly complex. But I'd like to thank everybody uh, coming, and I will. Uh, I'm also going to be supporting uh, Jeff Help Jeff Helpridge. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Fisher. Okay, uh, she may have been disconnected, so I'll, we'll have uh, someone text her. Uh, also, I'll move to Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Hell, oh, oh, I'm here. Sorry. Okay. okay. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry about that. I couldn't unmute my phone. Um, I am going to hold off until I hear all the other deliberations because I was very impressed with all three candidates. I have a little score sheet that I keep as I as the questions are asked and answered and all of the candidates did very well and so my tallying has not brought me to a decision so if it's all right i'm going to punt to hear um, everyone else and i just want to say i'm so pleased with the quality of the candidates with their um commitment to our community and breadth of knowledge of the issues i really don't think there is a wrong choice here but I'm going to hold to um, decide until I consider this further. So thank you. All right. Commissioner Stigman. Uh, Chair Savas, I guess I would kind of like to call a point of order. It, it seems awkward that we're not voting. Are, are, is this? Okay, this is, a, this is a similar process in which we used in the last um, appointment, which was District 38. So we did the same thing. Uh, Commissioner Smith was present. I'm not sure. I, I believe you were present. Yes. But this is the same yes. process we used before. Yes. So I just find it unusual that uh, that we're having one commissioner who is going to wait. I, I'm uncomfortable with that. OK. Um, so I, I would not disagree with that. So Commissioner Fisher, would you um, uh, either um, Commissioner Chair Savas, if I can uh, note, as part of deliberations, commissioners are not required to identify who they're voting for. This process is to offer your information or perspective on the presentations from both members of the public and the candidates. Um, so if commissioners don't wish to vote at this time, we're actually going to have a formal vote later on the agenda. Yeah, this is not the vote. This is, this okay. is deliberation. So you can vote. You can. Yeah, if, if you wish, you can, but you're certainly not required to. It, and it's not really a vote. You're just basically signaling, or, or I, I suppose is one way of wording it, if you choose to identify who you're favoring. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, well, yes, thank you to all three of the candidates. Uh, I know how difficult and challenging this is. And uh, quite honestly, I am really torn, which is... Uh, so it's a very, very difficult vote for me. Um, in my role as a Multnomah County Commissioner, we are dealing uh, with, with folks, you know, we are termed as the needy and the naughty. And uh, so I have always this perspective of how can we help uh, those most in need. And uh, for me, uh, immigration as an immigrant uh, and being a sanctuary county, uh, you know, that's just something really very personal for me and something that I've always fought for. Uh, and is almost at the core of kind of the work that we do. Uh, when I look at, at some of uh, Mr. Helfrich's uh, experience, I find it similar to my background of serving as a Gresham City Councilor, <coughs> serving on the Planning Committee, uh, being involved in economic development. Uh, he's got experience on the Budget and Charter Review Committee, uh, all similar things that I have found extremely beneficial for me uh, as a county commissioner. 
so uh, I, uh, all of the candidates were great. Uh, so I will just leave it at that, and then I will vote at the end. Okay. Commissioner Joplin. Good evening, thank you. And as well, in agreement with all those that have spoken before, I think we are lucky this evening to have such great candidates to choose from and appreciate their willingness to serve in sometimes a, a thankless position, but yet a very important one. Um, I, I will be supporting Jeff Helfrich, and my reasons are I support his public sector commitment in his profession, his voluntary committee participation that he has exemplified, his understanding of urban and rural policy differential by having experience of living in, in both um, examples, and then also his participation in Cascade Locks uh, leadership. Cascade Locks is in my district in Hood River County, and it's a very small and economically challenged community. And um, I appreciated all of his leadership and his ability to create collaboration with his time in Cascade Locks and um, I will be supporting him this evening and thank again all who have applied great candidates. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Humberston. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> well, I came here hoping, quite frankly, uh, to be able to vote for Clackamas County resident. But in being honest and in, in really evaluating both resumes and preparation <coughs> Uh, and experience, uh, I have come to the conclusion that one candidate uh, stood out above all the candidates in my mind. He had the broadest base of local government experience, which I think bodes well for those of us in Clackamas County um, in knowing that uh, we'll have somebody in the state legislature that understands local government. Um, his background in law enforcement resonates with me, obviously. Uh, he was the most prepared with di and, with, and had the most direct answers to questions without obfuscation uh, or what I would consider to be excessive glibness. So I will be casting my vote for Mr. Helrich. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Vega-Peterson. Uh, thank you so much. So I, um, this was a very tough decision. Um, this was the second um, time that we've had the opportunity to go through this appointment process and I, I have to say that if I've been so impressed with the candidates um, in both times who've stepped forward and want to serve in an office that um, is often a thankless job and is definitely a demanding job um, for not so much pay so um, I appreciate everybody stepping up to do the work um, having had the first first-hand experience with that you know I um, I have um, really it's been really interesting to get to know people in this short timeline i really have been enchanted with the term progressive republican which i've never heard before this evening um we'll, we'll talk jessica <laughs> everybody uh, has uh, and, and 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 how people are describing themselves and i've really been impressed with folks who are reaching um across the aisle and representing a very diverse um diverse district honestly i um actually you know from from my experience i think that having a broad range of experience and especially experience and working with the legislature is very helpful especially in the short term of um of a short session which is coming up very quickly and um you know i think that there's three well-qualified candidates but i think because of the intensity of the short term you know the short session that's coming up and being able to hit the ground running i think stan pulliam has the best um the best chance of doing that so that's who i'll be voting for today Thank you. Uh, Commissioner McBride. I'm here. Um, boy, uh, I completely agree with all of the statements that, that the other commissioners have made. What a, what a great group of individuals we have who have stepped up for public service. Um, to save you all my verbosity, I will cast my vote for uh, Jeff Helfrich and uh and stand aside and listen to the outcome thank you uh commissioner schrader okay thank you as someone who's been through the appointment process personally 
um, as well as now seems to be doing multiple appointment processes across the, <laughs> the board. I know how uh, difficult this is, and I uh, really uh, want to say thank you to all three candidates who really, I think, presented themselves very well today in front of this group of folks. Um, however, how, this is how I make the decision. I really, quite frankly, try to distance myself from it. I take everything that people are giving me. I try to uh, not make any prejudgments. And uh, the uh, piece for me that in the end, um, I always tell people this is I have to be here in front of people. I have to hear what they say. I have to hear what they, you know, what their answers are to things before I make a final decision. I truly, I know it's practically impossible. I really do try and come in and be as blank a slate as, uh, as possible because, uh, you know, how can you be fair, you know, otherwise? But I'm leaning right now, actually, we'll cast my vote for Mr. Helfrich. And one of the reasons, um, I'm going to do that, and again, I think all the candidates, when you look at the resumes on the paper, everybody's qualified, that wasn't the issue. But I think what moved me the most was the notion of the houselessness and homelessness that we're dealing with on the frontline level, uh, particularly with law enforcement, and his knowledge of the Community Re Reinvestment Justice Act. Because what that is telling me is he's understanding that local government and local leaders, oftentimes counties and mayor, our mayor is here today. Good to see you, Bill. Um, they're really on the front line of ha having to solve the problems. And sometimes our legislators are legislators without necessarily local government experience. But I find the ones that have had that local government background, and whether it be in land use and law enforcement, um, oftentimes bring a viewpoint that really localizes the issue. And in particular, as I work with the Association of Oregon Counties and the League of Oregon Cities, when we are trying to address houselessness and homelessness, not just within the urban rural umbrella of Clackamas County, because we have both, but statewide. We have come to the conclusion that really what we need is uh, something like the justice reinvestment folks out there to help all of our communities, cities, and counties across the, straight, the state with um, technical help. Because you can pass every law in the universe about what your policy is going to be about homelessness or houselessness. But if you don't know how to navigate the system, if you don't have that technical help, if you don't really help the bottom up help solve the problem, um, that's, a, that's a dilemma and that's a policy piece I've been working very hard on these, this past year with the Association of Counties and the League of Oregon Cities. That's not just going to only impact Clackness, but the state. So I just thought his knowledge and his understanding of that to me was impressive. So um, I'm going to finish up and that's where I'm going to go. Thank you. <clears throat> Commissioner Smith. Thank you. Excuse me a bit because I, I lost my voice this weekend at the uh, Phil Knight 80 birthday party watching all those basketball games. Um, I want to thank all the, uh, the uh, nominees for, for coming forward because um, committing and dedicating yourself to public service at the level of a state rep is a huge deal and you know it's difficult for me to to identify you know who is going to be the best for for this spot and um, like like Martha I you know housing is a huge deal for me and one of the things that stuck out for me in my interviews uh, with, with all three candidates was that there was a clear uh, candidate who uh, understood that uh, homelessness and housing is, is a big issue. And it was really made clear to me that um, Mr. Jeff uh, Helfrich is, uh, is, you know, 
head and shoulders above on, on the issues, all issues. And I, I wrote down the same thing, um, Commissioner, in regards to the Homeless and the Justice Reinvestment Act. That's a big deal. And also looking towards um, local government for ideas. That was, that was huge for me, and understanding that the I-205 bottleneck is a, is a problem and recognizing that that's something that the local uh, commissioners are concerned about. The other piece is that um, as a law enforcement person who's been on the streets of uh, Portland for 25 years, that, that was a huge um, plus in the fact that uh, the local land use um, uh, background and experience is is huge and so I had to kind of separate myself and say okay you know housing is a big issue but understanding the district that uh, 52 is land use is a big big deal and to actually hear someone uh, from law enforcement talking about uh, lessening the carbon footprint oh he had me at um, the word go <laughs> um, <laughs> and there are other law enforcement people I, I mean no disrespect but um, there was a lot of information that uh, rounded out my decision. And the last thing um, that I heard that no other uh, nominee talked about was serving a very diverse community. That is so, so important, you all, that we have to recognize that our communities are uh, browning and that we have to look at the entire community and make sure that our most vulnerable is helped. And so I, I, I will just say again, thank you to all the other candidates for, for putting your name in, but I'm gonna support um, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you, that brings us to Commissioner Perkins. And he was absent, correct? Okay. Correct. All right, so uh, Chair Kafori. Is Chair Kafori still with us? Yes, Chair Kafori is a little bit uh, technologically um, disadvantaged and had a <laughs> hard time finding the, the mute button. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Skilled at many things, iPhone, not one of them. Thank you so much. Um, and I apologize to everyone for not being able to be there in person tonight. I have a speaking engagement here in a few minutes and um, so I had to stay in town in Portland but I really appreciate um, everyone who came out tonight the community members who came to testify and especially to the three uh, gentlemen who have put themselves forward as candidates for House District uh, 52 as um, someone who served in the legislature herself I know um, and has put herself out there as a candidate for, for office, as th those of us who are voting today have. Um, it takes a lot of courage and maybe a little bit of, um, a little bit of uh, throwing caution to the wind to put yourself out there to be judged by your peers. But I want you all to know that you did a fabulous job tonight. It was a very difficult decision to make. And on that note, I will say I was as people said earlier, I didn't get a chance to, that I was uh, disappointed by the story in the Oregonian um, claiming that people were uh, trying to push the, this decision one way or, the, or another. I think it was a, um, an injustice to those of us who will be voting today. Um, I think we all are um, take our rules very seriously and take this decision we're making tonight very seriously and to insinuate that any of us would make a decision uh, based on other anything other than what we believe um, was uh, insulting to me. So um, I unfortunately did not get a chance to talk to the three candidates in person. I did receive many uh, emails and phone calls from from um, constituents and other people around the community asking for um, vying for one candidate or another. Um, in the end, I think, well, I said it's a very difficult decision. Um, my vote is tonight will go uh, with uh, Jeff Palrick, and um, I could go on and on about why, but I think it's been said very clearly, um, especially I appreciated the comments by Commissioner Joplin. I uh, would just have to say a ditto to what she has, what she said, and um, thank you again. <laughs> that brings us to Chair Rivers. Thank you, Chair Paul. Um, I want to thank all of the candidates uh, for showing the interest in serving the public. It's, um, sometimes it's a thankless job, 
but sometimes can be very, very rewarding. Uh, you all did a great job, and uh, I think that um, to me it's quite obvious uh, who stood out and who I'm going to vote for, and that would be Jeff Helfrich, without any further ado, because I don't want to extrapolate about any more things that have transpired here tonight, and I appreciate everybody's efforts, and uh, I'll leave it with that. Okay. Thank you, Ron. Uh, Chair Bernard. Uh, of course, I'm probably not like most people. I wake up every morning, can't wait to hear the news, can't wait to listen to it all day long, uh, consider immigration all day long. I really do. I uh, I was surprised uh, about uh, lack of knowledge of sanctuary law. It, uh, surprised me. Uh, of course, Clackamas County was sued and is known nationwide as being having been sued. Uh, uh, thinking that we had to obey the immigration people. Turns out uh, there, if the law is followed, we do, but when it's not, we don't. Um, I, uh, so for me, that solid answer uh, really turned me around, and that is when Jeff said, uh, it's the law. You know, for me, that, that turned me around. I also walked in here thinking I wanted a Clackamas County person uh, and, and a Sandy person, frankly. But uh, I, I, I think that the issue about sanctuary law is pretty solid to me. And yeah, I'm, I'm afraid the federal government's gonna punish us. Uh, but the law is the law and it's a simple answer. Um, I thought that, uh, I mean, I'd love to uh, uh, talk to Jeff or whoever is appointed about uh, Senate Bill 100 and the importance of preserving farm and forest, um, but, and how important I-5 is, but immigration, you know, if you talk to Clackamas County and Multnomah County, has large areas of farmland where the farmers are afraid who's gonna work for them and are plowing up their fields uh, and looking for help. Not that it should be the immigrants that do it, but you know, uh, us, when I was 11 picking berries, you won't find an 11 year old out picking berries anymore. Uh, besides we didn't make much money. So I, I, I'm uh, supporting Jeff tonight. And uh, it looks like uh, it might be leaning that way. So that's my vote. Okay. Well, I, I too want to thank all three candidates uh, for stepping up. It's uh, uh, a tough thing to do, and I was thinking on some of these questions, wow, how would I respond to that question? Um, so I, um, I'm really uh, impressed with, again, number one, your um, willingness to be here uh, and answer those questions. Uh, I was reckoning back to uh, just a few weeks ago when we did District 38, and I had a, we had a commissioner, I wanted to speak to what um, Commissioner Vega Peterson spoke to, and that was the experience. We had one one uh, um, one candidate uh, who had a lot of legislative experience, uh, but not elected experience. And we had another candidate that I liked, which had um, elected experience at the local level, knew local uh, politics very well, and had a business background. And um, uh, I realized that uh, Mr. Pulliam has the business background. Uh, Mr. Pulliam doesn't have the local experience, but he has the legislative experience. Uh, uh, Mr. Helfrich has the local experience, um, and I don't expect any um, candidate to know all the answers to all the questions, especially in something new. This is new territory for everyone. So um, I, you know, I made a lot of mental notes about some of the things. I thought I gave everyone really a, a, a pass on some of the errors that were spoken to, because it's really knowledge. It's not a matter of intent. I just think it's just a matter of just learning Yes, and I and I I would uh, as Chair Bernard stated I, I would I would love to see a clock someone who knows the county uh, I think through my, my last few days here I realized that the, the two counties are quite different more so than I thought I I love my colleagues um, in Hood River uh, Ron hope, hope you're doing well uh, wish you the best um, going forward um, and uh, uh, but I, I do want to go back to um, 
it, it's a tough call, and I, I can see, um, uh, I really think it's important to say, I'll, I'll speak to this again, that there's a little bit more small business or business presence, specifically small business presence in, in the legislature. So um, in that aspect, I'm leaning towards um, uh, Mr. Pulliam, but on the other hand, um, I can see that there is uh, plurality uh, exist here today. So uh, with that, uh, I guess we'll just move on to, um, oh, Commissioner, Commissioner Fisher, you are, are you still there? Okay. Okay, with that. Yes, I'm, I'm here. Sorry, I am also iPhone challenged. <laughs> the screen goes away and it's hard to unmute. Yes, I'm here. Okay, I'm uh, just, just curious if you had any other um, uh, close. I'm giving you a second chance here, but I just wanted to have you any, any closing comments. Yeah, I, um, I appreciated everybody's comments. I'll be casting my vote for Helfrich as well. All right. Okay, um, so where are we here? Okay, I'll, uh, I will now call for the vote. Uh, hey, Paul, Paul, sorry. Yes? This is, this is Jessica. Um, so I think what happened, we had a similar case that happened in with when um, we were voting for the last House District, where the, there, after the um, discussion that we had, it came pretty apparent who had the plurality of the votes, and as a sign of respect, I think we, and as, as you know, support of the person taking it, we decided to do it unanimously. Um, and I think if that's the case here, then, then um, which it seems to be, then, then I think that's something that we should do in this case as well. Okay. Commissioner, would you like to make the motion then for, uh, for a vote of? A claim. A claim. A unanimous ballot. A unanimous vote. Yes. I would vote for you, Dennis. I second that, Paul. Okay, move, okay moved and seconded. Um, all, uh, I, I any Chair, discussion? We already have a unanimous vote. No, no, oh, you mean no. totally yep. unanimous? We have a couple of people who are actually. Okay. Okay. So, so I, I guess, yeah, so there's a motion um, to vote for a unanimous, and there's a second. So I will just take the poll to see if there is a consensus to vote unanimously. For who? to vote unanimously, period. Or is that a uh, council um, story? So, as I understand, the intention of the commissioners is, that from, based from the deliberations, a uh, sufficient number of commissioners have declared their intention, I will note, not an actual vote, but their intention to vote for Mr. Helfridge. And the suggestion is that as a gesture of solidarity betwixt the commissions to uh, make that appointment a unanimous vote. However, uh, each individual commissioner that is present is uh, authorized to vote for whomever they want, even if it's not a unanimous vote. So it's if the vote goes forward, which I've heard a motion a second to do so, the motion would be for to vote unanimously for the appointment of Mr. Helfrich. Uh, and if someone votes no, I will indicate that they're saying it's not a unanimous vote. Okay. And then we would just take a roll call and each individual commissioner may express their preference for the, which candidate they would like. Okay. So uh, exactly. thank you for the clarification. Um, so uh, Clerk Moss, um, would you uh, take a poll? All right. Commissioner Myron? Yes. Commissioner Benton? Yes. Commissioner Fisher? Yes. Commissioner Stegman. And this is on the unanimous? Yes. Uh, for Steg uh, for yes. Jeff. For Mr. Helfrich, yes. Uh, I'm going to vote no, but not because I'm, <laughs> I do support Mr. Helfrich. I just don't support this process. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Joplin. Yes. Um, Commissioner Vega Peterson. Yes. Commissioner Humbertson? Yes. Commissioner McBride? Yes. Commissioner Schrader? Yes. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Uh, Chair Cafori? Yes. Chair Rivers? Yes. Chair Bernard? Yes. Chair Savas? I'll join Commissioner Segment and vote no. I, I don't think there's any other choice because it's already, it's moot at this point, correct? It, it is moot. It's not <laughs> unanimous, so therefore, um, regardless how I vote, um, um, it's not going to be unanimous. So therefore, call for the vote. Oh, well, actually, there needs to be a motion. So we need a motion to for a candidate. Uh, 
I move that we move. Actually, as an order of process, you would simply do a roll call for each commissioner, then each commissioner would state the candidate that they prefer to be appointed. So okay. each commissioner would then state in that. All right. So, Clerk Moss. Thank you, Chair Savis. Commissioner Myron. Uh, Jeff Helfrich. Okay. Commissioner Benton. Yeah, Helfrich. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Fisher. Jeff Helfrich. Okay. Commissioner Stigman. Jeff Helfrich. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Joplin. Jeff Helfrich. Commissioner Humbertson. Jeff Helfrich. Commissioner Vega Peterson. Jeff Helfrich. Commissioner McBride. Jeff Helfrich. Commissioner Schrader. Jeff Helfrich. Commissioner Smith. Jeff Helfrich. Chair Kafori. Jeff Helfrich. Chair Rivers. Jeff Helfrich. Chair Bernard. Jeff Helfrich. Chair Savas. Out of respect, Jeff Helfrich. So, what's the score? That uh, yeah, has to be pretty well. Have to be unanimous fun. anyway. Yeah, trap you as you tell. So, uh, on behalf of the uh, Clackamas County Board of Commissioners, the Hood River Board of Commissioners, and Willamette County Commissioners, I'd like to congratulate Jeff Helfrich. Uh, on his appointment to the Oregon House, and we look forward to working with you for the benefit of the, the public in our areas. I ask that our colleagues here today not depart until you sign uh, the, the board clerk um, uh, signature list there, uh, so we have the official record, uh, so we can pr uh, provide that to the Secretary of State. So Kevin, uh, if you can now please collect the signatures, and with that, um, I believe it's time to adjourn. We're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.